Okay, folks, here we go. And only one minute late, so we're doing better than ever. This is Ryan and Ben. They are from our AV support people, so they have set up all of what's streaming out of here, etc. So without further ado, I just hand to them. Hi, um, my name is Ryan, that's Ben, as he just said. Um, this is a two-part talk, so I'm doing about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then uh, Ben will do about 15, 20 minutes. Um, I'm going through a very broad brass overview of budget conference AV, um, and Ben's the author of DV Switch, being the central software you're using, he'll go through that. Um, and we're setting up a BOF, I think, after? Right. When's that? Okay, there's a BOF somewhere, look at the wiki, should be up there. Um, all right, uh, myself, I've been working in AV on and off um, since 2001. Um, originally started doing a lot of Apple surrounds and stuff back in 2001, so that was all sort of uh, single row multi camera sort of stuff with traditional hardware uh, mixers. Um, very expensive, but uh, it was good fun. Um, and since 2004, primarily my day job has been um, running an open source centric IT solutions development company. Um, and I recently formed a company called Next Day Video to uh, sort of get into doing a lot of this sort of, sort of stuff again. Um, most of it won't be using DV Switch, but it'll be using a lot of the workflow ideas I'll be going, I'll be going through in my presentation. Um, and, yep. Okay, my first volunteer experience was LCA 2004. Um, this was interesting because I wanted to do it using the Apple strengths and stuff I was very familiar with. Um, this wasn't approved, but we ended up doing DV tapes. And it sounded simple. I'd done DV tapes before, get a bunch of cameras, record the DV, no issue at all. It turns out doing the stuff at scale is pretty much impossible. I mean, you're talking, I think 2004 was four streams, five days. You know, you're talking 200 tapes or something like that. It's just ridiculous. Um, and uh, volunteer AV is a very, very unique challenge. Um, you've got very different things. I mean, um, budget technology is using equipment that generally isn't as robust. Um, your skill test is different. I mean, typically with conference, sorry, with commercial AV, um, you can put you know, skilled people in each room. So if there's issues, they can solve it. With volunteers, obviously, you haven't got that luxury. So it's very, very different to manage it. Um, so yes, it's, it's been quite interesting. I've learned quite a lot doing it. Um, these are the conferences I've been involved with. Um, LCA 04 was DV tapes. Um, 06 was using flu motion. 07 was uh, Sylvia ran did the DVD recorder method, which was really good. 08 was using DVD recorders, but with an improved workflow um, and essentially improving, uh, I guess, a feedback loop to ensure the quality from uh, volunteers. Um, done FOSDEM, uh, the Debian stuff, and DebConf. Um, this is where I met Ben. Um, this is uh, using DV Switch, which is great stuff, which he'll go through. Um, they also use a software called Penta, which is their workflow software, which I'll run through soon. Um, now, they're very, very different conferences. They're two rooms, and generally speaking, they have the same flow of volunteers every year. So you end up with a core team, or I, I guess most volunteers are quite skilled, uh, with only some new newbies. So um, there's not so much focus on volunteer training. Where LCA being a very big conference, and you have a different team every year, um, it's, it's a very different challenge. You need to, you need to effectively um, you know, work out how to train people who have never done AV before and manage it at, uh, manage it at scale. Um, PyCon USA 2009 was taking the DV switch stack from DevConf and mixing it with some of the stuff we have developed for LCA 2008, being the being uh, things like recording sheets, better training, uh, feedback loop for uh, you know feedback, dedicating people to specific tasks. DevConf generally has a whole bunch of people who know what they're on about, um, where LCA was more having a you know dedicated central team with specific tasks and delegating down things to uh, AV team peer room. Uh, I won't go over that too much, though. Um, LCA's typically had very mixed success. Most years, since 2004, have actually had video recording. Um, most of them actually had a successful video getting recorded somewhere, whether it's DV tape or hard drive. Um, but it takes months to come out, sometimes not at all. Why is that? Turns out many of the issues we've had aren't LCA specific. Most conferences, in fact, I think all conferences have been to have had the same issues at some point in the past. Um, i run through some of those. Um, each component of AV is very, very simple, especially as a geek. I mean, you know, it, it's, not, it's not a problem at all. I mean, you know, you can, you can get a mixer. You can plug mics in. You can get sound out. That's easy. You can uh, record stuff for a DV camera. No problems. You can plug in a video AV. No problems. You know, you can encode, record a video. You can upload it. 
for a gig, these are difficult problems. The, the issue is dealing with this stuff at scale, you know, especially with LCA, you've got five rooms. It's just, you know, you have a minor issue, it's completely impossible to try to resolve. So it's effectively, um, I, I guess one of the biggest issues, especially from a big perspective, is understanding how you piece all this stuff together in a way that actually makes sense. You know, you get an A to Z workflow occurring. Um, and this is, this is one of the issues with LCA and other, other, other conferences, is an incomplete workflow. Um, you know, there was a way to develop recording video and a way to develop publishing that, but that necessarily didn't marry together very easily. And uh, when you tested it in a, love, uh, in, in a lug, for example, um, it wasn't a problem. But of course, when you're dealing with, you know, two, three hundred videos, it's completely insane. So a small issue tends to just basically, you know, throw a spanner in the works. Um, there are tech issues, um, delegates, and sometimes speakers, unfortunately, can make life interesting and they're understandable mistakes. Um, you know, things like unplugging cables, unplugging, you know, AV machines, things like hard drive corruption occurs. Um, very, very simple things can occur that can make the AV, uh, AV team's life very difficult. Um, and things like, I mean, the thing that typically bites a lot of AV teams are small variants in hardware. So you, know, you sort of get to the venue when you didn't envisage you know, something was going to be interfaced in, in quite some way. So you make some small variants of the hardware and you don't pick up as an issue until you've recorded a couple of days worth of recording and it just tends to bite you. I mean, a good example is SCR 2004. We uh, just used our DV cameras borrowed from people and uh, we actually had Speaks boxes recording directly from the, uh, the lecterns uh, into Speaks, which was great. You know, we could get recorded audio, we could get recorded video. Missing it together, <coughs> in theory, shouldn't be an issue, but it, it turns out that um, the... I think the timing is slightly different. So basically, there was a variance of about two seconds by the end of by, by the time we played the one-hour talk. There was a two-hour, two-second difference. Um, so you effectively had to stretch your audio, and that was a complete nightmare. Um, stuff like that. Um, other things I can think of too is you know sometimes you might change. Uh, you might get the venue AV. They didn't have a cable you envisaged. Um, so you end up plugging in a different cable, and you end up with left channel only audio, which gets encoded. You know stuff like that. It's they're small things, but to deal with them at scale is a nightmare. Um, so it's effectively getting that that stuff right. Um, now, I, I workflow is the most important part of any video strategy. It, it's, again, the stuff I'm covering. It's effect, effectively having an A to Z solution for dealing with video. Um, avoid dealing with data manually. It's a complete nightmare. Um, automating as much as possible and componentizing every room setup. So effectively coming up with a room setup that works, is solid, is documented, and that replicate that in every room. Um, and yeah, effectively test for all, all potential issues and have procedures defined for dealing with them because um, it's impossible to be in many places at once. Okay, things a workflow should include are things like managing the schedule with recorded video data. Um, I mean, one big logistical issue which you don't foresee is, okay, you've got all these video files, what do you do with them then? You know, you need to work out where is that video file associated with, what, what talk, what should be named, um, generate a title for it, stuff like that. Um, so if you can have software that will basically take the schedule off the web website and associate that with video files, that makes your life a lot easier. That's something that's very easy to underestimate alone. Um, control the quality and provide feedback loop. Um, this was something that O4 taught me, I guess. Is um, <coughs> It's very, very hard to pick up because you can't be in you know, five places at once. It's very, very hard to pick up whether volunteers are making mistakes. So there needs to be a way to actually control that, that, control that, uh, you know, control that quality. So um, allow rapid communication between rooms, um, record, uh, use recording sheets which I'll show you later, stuff like this. So you're effectively getting feedback from, uh, from volunteers. Um, I like rapid post editing. One of the biggest mistakes people make is wanting to post edit the stuff in a, in a video editor. It's, it's nuts, especially with this sort of stuff. I mean, you know, you can record a, a log and have no problems editing a video, but when you're trying to record or trying to post edit, you know, 200 talks, it's just, it just doesn't happen. Um, distributing out tasks essentially to the volunteers, there should be a way to do that. Um, and yeah, allow automated transcoding, uploading files, Total generation stuff like that. Um, yep, and some workflow issues can be solved by software, but others are management issues. Okay, common mistakes people make. Um, you know, I can record a VGA feed and a camera feed. Mixing should be easy, right? And I think I already covered this previously. You know, you're talking about a huge amount of data. It's just logistically impossible. Um, manually editing LCA video would take over two hours of man time. It's just, it's crazy. And distributing it out is difficult as well. I mean, you know, you, you can record, say you've got DV tapes or you record stuff to, to files. Um, you know, I mean, you, you've got people from, let say, you know, physically distributed around the world or even the country. I mean, how do you get data to them? How do they get data back? It's all sorts of stuff like that. Um, 
this other one. Now, record mixed video or use a single camera source and upload very roughly cut video. Should be simple. Again, you've got, you've got issues logistically, you know, farming that out again. Same sort of stuff. And again, manually dealing with this stuff is just complete. Uh, it just takes ages. Many examples I can keep giving. Okay, um, again, this is a very rough overview, so I'm not going to go through in much detail, but this is an example of solution. Um, <coughs> VGA capture device. Now, the, these things are fantastic. These things here are the twin packs. These take a VGA signal in from a laptop and convert it to DV. Um, the reason why we do that is pointing a camera at the screen, generally not great, especially once you encode it down. You just, you just can't see what's going on. Um, they're only they're $600. They're a brilliant investment. In fact, you can't get them cheaper if you look around. Um, basic mixer, Lepo handheld microphone, USB sound card, about $300. These things are important. Um, I've, seen, I've seen video done with just the, the microphone and a camera. The problem with them is they're, they're, they're ambient mics. They pick up a lot of background noise. Very distracting. You can't hear what's going on. Um, getting, getting clear VGA and getting clear um, audio are very, very important to get for a successful video. Um, a basic firewire camera. Um, this is something people overestimate. Um, you can just pick up a basic firewire camera, and as long as your lighting's decent enough, and this room is fantastic for that, it's good enough. You know, you don't need to spend big money in a camera. You know, the most important thing is to get is people's slides and the audio. The, the camera is still important to communicate. You know, what the speaker's doing, but it's not 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 crucial. Um, using DV shoot software, um, which then I'll go through. But essentially, this takes multiple sources, multiple audio and video sources, and spits out a single DV file, which avoids the whole post-editing situation. Um, edit on the fly. Very very important. Um, the way we distribute out the encoding and uploading is we um, are sync all the laptops um, centrally to some giant NFS storage. I think this year we've got eight terabytes or something. Um, and we use some software. In this case, we're using Vapor, which basically does all the workflow stuff. So effectively taking those video files, um, you know, associating the files with talks, allowing us to do basic QA, automating the encoding, allowing QA of those encoder files, and then uploading them. Um, and encoding powers kind of neat because we just use the encoding machines for, uh, sorry, the, the capture machines for encoding machines every night. Um, so they're just connected together and uh, Vapor will dispatch our jobs. So essentially we just uh, NFS, NFS mount a share and run a script and it just goes and does the rest from a Postgres database. Um, been through some of this, but audio, very, very important to get right. Absolutely crucial. I mean, I mean, record something with a normal camera and try listening to it. It's just distracting. You get about five minutes in, and it's just like, I'm not paying attention anymore. Um, video quality, again, VGA. Get VGA raw. Um, again, pointing a camera at the projector is just, just yeah, it, it works. It's better than nothing. But if you can, definitely go for something like that. Um, and yeah, the AV loop deployed in rooms need to be significantly tested before the conference. Um, I, I've seen this done many times where, you know, a, a team will record like a small meeting. And they'll have some technical issues, but they're not big because you can be in the room and you can solve them, right? They're not a major problem. But of course, when you're deploying the stuff into several rooms, um, you know, small issues are big issues. Um, you know, you're not there; someone else is there, so they don't they may not necessarily recognise them as issues. Or alternatively, they'll, they'll solve them the wrong way. So, you know, ensuring that the loop is basically tested as well as possible. And by loop, I mean everything from putting equipment in place, running it, recording it, saving it putting it somewhere, dealing with it, uploading it. The entire A to Z process is important. And training your volunteers, this is really key. Um, they need to, you can't just basically set up equipment and go use it. You know, I mean, issues will occur. You, you avoid it if possible, but they need to understand how this stuff works. You know, uh, and especially with, the, with conferences like this, you know, you have geeks, you have people who are capable of this stuff. So, you know, training them on, on how this stuff works and how to problem solve um, is really, really key. Um, strong team management, um, you definitely need clear roles, responsibilities to find. I've seen a few AV teams completely tank because, you know, there were many, many, many school people involved, but no one knew what, you know, what, who should be doing what. So multiple people running around trying to solve the same issues and it all just tanked, unfortunately. Um, on, on the same note, though, you know, you need to make sure that there's multiple people capable of solving these issues and, uh, you know, you're defining essentially how to solve these issues. Um, <laughs> You know, so you don't have the two points of making there that you don't have a single person as a bottleneck. So you, so you have one person responsible for a few things, you know, and they get busy, stuck in one issue, and they can't solve other issues. Oh, and you don't have the second issue I run through as well, where right, you've got too many people solving issues in, in uh, conflicting ways. Um, big reason why a lot of AV tanks is just, yeah, multiple people are trying to do multiple things in different ways. Um, example video, that website up there is really, really good. Um, that's Mirror Community is a video aggregator. Um, what that does, it aggregates video from various sources that, that we've done Python video for. Um, 
the stuff from PyCon US 2010 and PyCon Australia 2010 is really brilliant examples of uh, the DV switch and VAPI workflows I'm talking about. Um, all these things allow for really high quality video done by volunteers on a budget, and most of these videos are published within two days of the videos being recorded. Um, it could have been done quicker if there weren't some other logistical uh, issues, but you always have them with AV, it's just, just part of it. Um, some URLs there. The, the first one is a cycle video collective. That's an attempt, it's a wiki, and it's an attempt to basically document a lot of this stuff centrally. So uh, the idea is for our various AV teams to document the way they do things, the way they've solved issues, stuff like this, um, open community basically. The second one is the Git repository for Vapor. Um, this is the workflow software I was speaking about. Third one being DVSwitch, but I'm sure Ben will cover that. And the last one is an example of things like recording sheets, which I'll actually show you guys now. How are we going for time? Okay, so I mean, really important things to have for for, uh, for teams are things like this. You know, you basically got things called cheat sheets. So they run through individual components of each AV system, the AV system. So I mean, training is crucial, but you know, a lot of it's going to gel over people's heads because it's a lot of information to take in. So you know, provide them with information on how to do individual things, um, separate it onto different sheets. So this explains how to run the software at the back, for example. You know, how to start it, how to record, how to switch sources, how to do picture in picture stuff like this. Um, the twin pack, which is the device at the front here, you know, how, how, to, how to use it, recommend a settings, if things aren't working, you know, series of steps to problem solve. Because um, again, assuming things aren't going to go wrong is silly. It's AV, things will go wrong. Um, same thing, general tips and info, you know, before each talk, during each talk, general suggestions and tips, you know, very important to have for the, uh, for the volunteers. Um, and these things are fantastic, these are recording sheets. These are basically, what you do here is, um, these are now automated from Vapor, which is fantastic. They actually pull out the schedule and print them out automatically, but these are the older ones. Um, you write down the session name, what it is, when the recording started, when the recording ended, and then you note some problems. Now the nice thing about DV switch is every time you save a file, it splits out a different file name. So you effectively write the file names down here, because the file names are dates, timestamps. Um, so what, what effectively happens is, you know, recording team records stuff. When we get the QA, the QA team takes these sheets, they've got files. They can look at this and go, okay, well, that talk has these files associated with it. There was an audio issue in the middle there, so they can quite quickly QA. They can go through, these are the files I want, all right, I'll go through there, I'll cut that bit out, done. So you basically take QA for a video down from, you know, maybe an hour and a half, two hours of a video editor to five minutes. You know, so you can get videos out very, very rapidly. Um, let's see if I can show you if it's still got it there. This is our current server running uh, videos. So you can see the, can you see that? Yeah, cool. We've got a five, we've got a 7.2 terabyte database. Uh, this is the NFS server where everything's being synced to. Um, so we've got DV, um, all the room numbers. So say uh, N519, got all the dates there. Yeah, there yesterday's talks, for example, there are synced nightly from each machine. So that makes it very, very easy to deal with. You know, if you're really, even dealing with this manually would be much, much easier than just having a whole bunch of DV files or tapes or stuff like this. Um, and each one of those files will associate to a recording on the recording sheet. So, you know, much easier to deal with. And this thing's called the Vapor. Um, again, it's an example of a workflow. There are different ones. Debian uses um, Penta, is it? Penta is the general conference software. Okay, right. But, okay, so it's, yeah, right, right, right. That means it ties into the schedule and stuff like that, right? Yeah. So this is an example, but again, I mean, this effectively will associate with the video files. So we've got a LCS here. The CSS is broken. I don't know why. Um, so these are our talks. And the nice thing about it is we're actually got a script that actually will go through, for example, and uh, if I've got, let's say, one from the 24th. You know, it's already gone through and it's already associated videos with it because we basically run a, we run a script which will go through and look at the actual schedule. Um, look at the start and end time and associate files with it. So this makes QA very rapid. We basically go through here and go, all right, Play that, play that, all right. Um, we want to cut off the first, we want that file, for example. We want to cover the first two seconds of it. Click, 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 click. And you've got various states, so you can save the shapes. So right now it's in, uh, okay. Normally it will start an edit, which means please edit the file. You'd go through, you'd, you'd select what files you want. You then put it in the code. Then there's a little uh, script that runs in, a, runs in a loop, looks for anything in the code state, grabs it, encodes it, 
spits it out, puts it in review state, which means we then review the actual final file. If we think it's good, we stick it in post. Another script running in a loop will sit there and look for anything in post, uh, a post, then it will go and post it, then it will tweet it, then it will be done. So it's completely automated, basically. It, it takes QA down to you know five minutes per video, rather than hours and hours and hours. Um, yeah, so how are we doing on time? Good? Yeah, sweet. Good. But yeah, this was meant to be a very rough overview. I haven't gone through any of the detail I'd like to. Um, yeah, it comes to the editor, Saboth. Should be on the wiki, I'm sure. Should be up in a second. Mic on? Is that good? Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, right, well, I've already been introduced, so let's move on to uh, this. I've uh, uh, been working uh, professionally as a programmer since 1998. Uh, um, now mostly uh, contributing to the Debian project, um, aside from my uh, professional work. Uh, I've been involved with the Debian video team since 2005. Um, I got involved after the conference and have been involved in uh, actually at the conferences uh, several times since then. I started the video link and DB switch projects uh, specifically for DebConf um, and uh, Ryan says they've been, they've been used at several other conferences, uh, or DB Switch has been used at several other conferences since then. Um, yeah. So DB Switch is a software system for video mixing, uh, which is done live, recording uh, to files, and streaming, which hopefully you've seen here. Uh, it's primarily designed for free software conferences, starting with DebConf, as I said. Um, uh, 
the uh, concerns of uh, free software conferences are community benefit and not, not commercially uh, enterprises, mostly. So uh, the aim is to, to make videos available to the maximum number of people. So uh, both recording and streaming are important. Um, they have a very limited budget. Um, Brian showed an example of, of uh, 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 a budget, but actually you can go you can go lower than that with some loss of quality. Uh, you can uh, the first conference that Debian you used DB switch out was DevConf seven, where we had pretty much nothing left over after hiring projectors and PA. So all the cameras were borrowed, all the tripods were borrowed, the computers were borrowed. Uh, there was some money spent on DV tapes as a backup. Um, and that what the, the, the resulting videos aren't brilliant, but uh, they're, st they're still better than, than the average at the time. Uh, we have eager volunteers, but not much time to train them. So DV switch is, I would say, fairly, fairly easy to use, fairly easy to, to learn. Um, many conferences don't actually care about streaming, but they've still found this uh, the, the live mixing useful. Um, live mixing obviously saves editing, as Ryan said, and it's interactive. Um, sounds obvious; most video mixes are interactive, but some uh, some software used for streaming has very limited. Uh, very limited options to change the, the way mixing is done uh, while it's running. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the primary uh, developer of DB Switch. I get some, some help, some patches from other people, um, but it's mostly just me at the moment. And I have other projects to work on, so uh, I'm not... Uh, I'm, I'm limiting what I want TV switch to do. Not a general video, so it's not going to do, not going to support any kind of any kind of non-linear post editing. It's not doing audio mixing. Uh, you can get pretty cheap audio mixers that do uh, a good job, um, and I believe you could use, uh, in theory, you could use Jack to do this in software. It's not a complete recording and publishing software for that. You can use uh, Vapor or uh, uh, Devin's. Uh, Pentapath extensions, or it was something I quickly whipped up for PyCon. It's not too difficult to do this sort of thing. Brief explanation of what DV actually is. Um, the uh, there are several variants of this DV format. Sorry. Got I've got the mic on. Um, I'm on the right. Is that better? Okay. Yeah, okay. How's that? How's that? Okay. Uh, so, there are several variants of the DV formats. Um, a lot of consumer cameras uh, support it. Less so today, you're seeing a lot of uh, HD uh, cameras using H.264 format, but they're still pretty easy to get cheap DV cameras. Um, most sort of pr prosumer and low-end professional cameras also support some flavor of DV. The cameras that I've uh, dealt with have been uh, they've used the basic DV formats, which is sort of meant for consumers. There are DV Cam and DVC Pro you may see around, which probably work, but I haven't had a chance to test them. Um, there are several other variants that just won't work uh, with DV Switch. A uh, nice thing about DV is that each frame is compressed separately. Um, with MPEG, MPEG codecs make make uh, use of the fact that each frame is similar to, is usually similar to the previous one, 
and so there are dependencies between the compressed information for each frame that makes it significantly harder to do editing in real time. Uh, with DV, we can just cut between frames. Um, so there's an overview of uh, how the various software components will fit together. Uh, you have sources, cameras, um, a BGA grabber is pretty much the same as a camera uh, for our software purposes. Audio mixer, those all feed into DV switch, which can then, uh, which then outputs to syncs, file storage, uh, a streaming server, potentially any command you like, although I don't know what else you want to use. Um, you can also use a file storage as a source. Uh, you can have a sort of um, ident or logo as a uh, kind of a holding screen uh, for, a, for a stream while people are waiting for the talk to begin. So the source types are uh, a firewire or USB DV device. Um, I haven't seen them, but I know some cameras, uh, some DV cameras have a USB connection which you can get DV over. Um, but mostly you'll see the firewire connections for, for DV cameras. Um, audio, you can use any ELSA, any native capture device supported by ELSA. Um, uh, what we've been using lately are uh, USB audio uh, devices. Um, the trouble with the audio inputs on most laptops is they're designed for microphones directly connected. And those don't work with the, with the um, voltage that you would get out of a, uh, a, an audio mixer. Uh, USB audio uh, devices normally have line input, which works fine. Uh, physical sources, of course, are around the room. Um, got this here, and you can't run a firewire cable uh, to the back of the room. Or you might be able to go away with it, but it's out of spec. So instead, we have a computer, there's a computer below the desk here connected to that, and then uh, Ethernet connecting the, the several computers together. Um, so then we, the uh, DV streams are, are encapsulated in TCP IP. Uh, the original, the current protocol for DV switch has uh, a network server running on the DV switch mixer, which is a little weird because this is a GUI application running as a server. Um, and so there are some scripts to start up the, the, uh, the mixer, the sources, the sinks in the right, in the right order. Um, a later enhancement to this protocol, um, which is not being used here, um, but has been used at DevConf with some success, uh, are tally lights. When you have uh, several camera operators around the room and not close to the mixing desk, they need to know, uh, they need to know, is the view from my camera being used? Uh, if it is, then they shouldn't, they shouldn't be moving the camera very much. If it is, uh, sorry, if, if the view is not being used, then they're free to pan, zoom as fast as they want. Uh, without making the viewers sick. So a tally light uh, indicates, uh, is this camera in use? Uh, and the, the, so there's a extent, uh, there was an extension to the protocol to support that. What I'm in, a pro, in the process of doing, uh, and hope to include in the next release, is using the standard RTP and RTSP uh, protocols for uh, connecting sources. Uh, this is, it's more extensible, uh, it's standard, it works with, uh, it would allow DV switch to interoperate with other, other software, uh, not just its own uh, programs. Uh, that would also mean that the mixer would be a client, so you could get the sources running as servers, uh, just start them up when the, the source computer is switched on, and no need for scripting. You just have a configuration file for, for DV switch. Uh, so the syncs are for types are for recording. Uh, a file sync record to diff. Uh, that's the DV interchange format. Um, and you can also have a sync that pipes to any command, and that's what's used for streaming. Uh, also connected using TCP IP. Um, possibly not a good idea for recording because 
um, if you have any disruption to the network, then um, you're going to, end up, going to end up uh, dropping uh, dropping frames. It's really best to record locally and then uh, move the files over later. So the original protocol is very similar to the, the protocol used for connecting sources. Uh, as a later enhancement, the sync tells us tells the mixer whether it's a recording sync or a uh, streaming sync, and a recording sync will get information telling it to when to start and stop recording, when to cut, so to create a new file. Um, in the next release, we'll have a built-in file file sync just for local recording, um, a pipe sync, which you can then connect up to Netcat or whatever if you want to, to send the data elsewhere. Um, and also an RTP, RTSP server, which you can use for remote monitoring. Uh, so I believe with the current version of VLC, you can just use that as uh, a monitor for, you will be able to use that as a monitor uh, in addition to the, the the display and the main GUI, so there's a uh, the, the, what the user interface looks like. Um, it's fairly simple. Um, we have the recording control buttons. Uh, hopefully self-explanatory. Um, and mixing effect, which are very limited at the moment. This is. Not, there's no real bling, it's just uh, for recording information. So you have the picture-in-picture picture effect, which you see, uh, see you've got the speaker in the bottom right of the corner overlaid over the slides. Uh, there's also, although it's not shown here, there's a, a fade for slightly nicer transitions between sources. There's an audio level monitor, which is basically good enough to let you know whether the audio is actually plugged in properly. Um, and to see if the audio is clipping, if the audio level is too high, then it will will be limited and it will sound awful. Uh, if it's too low, again, people won't be able to hear. Uh, there's a monitor for each source, uh, each video source, uh, uh, and uh, selection buttons. Uh, so you can independently independently select the video and audio sources. Uh, there's a secondary video selection which is used for uh, selecting what goes in, uh, what is the smaller picture in picture-in-picture. Uh, picture. So here we have source three as the, as the primary video selection and source, sorry, source four as the primary video selection and source two as the secondary. Uh, and source one, which has no picture, that's the audio source, that's just a connected to an audio mixer. At some point in the future, DV Switch will actually know the difference between an audio and video source, and it won't display this pointless black uh, thumbnail. Um, I could explain about the mixer internals, but um, if anyone was interested, but um, how are we doing for time? Yeah, I think we'll just move on to Icecast, which I promised to talk about. Um, the Icecast uh, streaming server is uses HTTP, which is not really the most efficient way of streaming, but it works. Uh, anyone can use that in uh, in an HTML5 video or audio element, uh, except in Chromium where it's broken. Uh, is that going to be fixed in Chromium? Um, I hope so. I think someone pointed out on the. Uh, Pointed to a bug report on the um, chat list for, for this. It's going to be fixed by Google and Chrome. I hope it's going to be fixed. So each stream that a server uh, handles can either come from a source client or it can be relayed uh, from another Icecast server. So in that way, you can start to build a, a network. Um, we have servers inside and outside the conference, uh, which all provide the same set of streams. Uh, so here we have 
coming in from the left of this diagram, you have the uh, DV stream coming from DV switch that goes into a sink, which is the that's a command sink, pipe sink, uh, which is running a, a FFmpeg2 Theora to transcode that to OgTheora and Vorbis, and then that's piped into a uh, an IceCast client. That sends over the the Theora stream to the internal master server. That's then can <coughs> there's an external master that relays all those streams and a bunch of public servers out there in the cloud that relay from the external master. So when you connect to a, a stream from here, you'll uh, be connecting to. Actually, it's a bit more complicated here, but let's let's ignore the complications. If you connect here from to a stream from inside the conference, you're connecting to the internal master. Uh, somewhere out, someone out there on the internet, if they connect to the streams, they'll get to one of these public servers. Uh, and there's very little bandwidth being used uh, between the inside and the outside. Possibly not a huge concern here, thanks to AARnet, but a lot, a lot of conferences that would be, you, know, you can have quite a thin pipe. So, so yeah, this sort of, uh, there's this flexibility in the way you set up IceCast servers is rather useful. Um, that's really all I've got to say. Um, got some links for further information about those two programs. Um, and now I think there's a little bit of time for questions to both to me or to, or to Ryan. Excuse me. Does someone have a, a mic for the audience? So um, a comment first, like at least in Chrome 8, it seems to be working okay, so it's, maybe it's just something they broke recently and we'll fix again, because I could just see your feed. All right, that's great. On my laptop. Okay. Right. So um, the question was, with the picture in picture, is that configurable, like where that shows up? Is there some kind of template that you could um, configure? It's, it's configurable. You just um, hit picture in picture and then drag out the rectangle where you want the, uh, the smaller picture to appear. Sorry, it's in the so it's in the GUI. You just yes. drag and drop it wherever you want. Cool, thanks. In in Ubuntu, I think Debian two app get install DV switch. Correct. That's right. Yep. That's it. Others. When you were talking about QA, what kind of activities actually go into the QA process? Um, it's it's fairly simple what we do. I mean, we used to do a lot of uh, editing in a in an editor. Logically, um, and yeah, just 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 a nightmare. But generally, what ends up happening is you basically do top tailing, so chop off the excess video. Um, occasionally, you might have things inside the video you want chopped out. Very very rarely, but you get those requests sometimes. You know, um, audio normalization, which can be automated. Um, you know, some color balancing is about it really. Most of it's just chop chop, encode, off you go. I notice you've got the uh, mix of the, um, the screencast and the, um, pers the speaker cast. Um, are you able to s move that around when the slides get in the way and things like oh, that? Oh yeah, absolutely. A picture in picture is configurable. So you've got you've got a picture in picture button there. If that's not clicked, you got one. You got sources, right? Oh, we should probably explain the. Did you explain the UI? Yeah. You did. Okay. I thought I did. Well, you explain it again. <laughs> You're the author. Um, so you set up the you select your the the uh, large picture of the background is the is your primary video selection. Let's use the top top uh, video selection button. The picture to be, to be displayed inside on top of that is the secondary selection. And then when you when you press picture in picture, you then you then drag out an area uh, in that uh, in the video monitor where you want that secondary video source to to appear. And then uh, click apply or press that's, enter. That's your primary. That's your secondary. So I mean, you've got an option of either going one, two, one, two, or you click picture in picture, drag it out, and then click picture in picture, which is an effect, and then two becomes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, like two minutes into the video, he changes the slide so it's covering uh, where you've got yeah. your video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then you get no effect. Mm. Yep. So you just escape. have to keep playing around. So you'd hope you'd hope you could do it for the whole thing, but in reality, you might have to adjust every few minutes. Yeah. You might hope that's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. 
you, you do have to do. You really have to uh, pay attention, and and uh, and you have to keep switching throughout the, the throughout a talk. And is that process of moving the the picture just a, a, a case of clicking on the picture and dragging it around, or do you have to? Uh, at the moment, you have to drag out a rectangle. You can't actually, you can't move the rectangle. No. Any others? Yep. One, two, couple more. Uh, some of us use um, Og Theora for, for small things, but you guys are probably the biggest user of some of this sort of technology. How have you found um, encoding into Theora? Yeah. Um, it's not terribly fast. Um, it's the results used to be pretty bad at low uh, bit rates. It's got better with uh, Theora 1.1, uh, aka Thusnelda. Um, there are promises of, of improvements, but I would guess in in future we'd be looking. You should probably be looking at WebM. One more. Um. I was, I was going to ask, with a lot of the cheaper consumer cameras now, you said that's what you're using, but um, a lot of them coming out now recording to AVC HD, so yeah. is that going to be a problem because H.264 is yes, it is going to be a problem. Yes, it's not, uh, it's not open source friendly. Um, well, not so much that, but it's the technical problem of um, uh, you have this dependency between frames. It gets a lot harder to... DV, is it how many bytes in a frame? Depends on the uh, whether it's PAL, NTSC, or whatever. But you have a fixed size per frame, yeah, so and you can just buy here, buy here, new video. So you can cut it just like you could cut film. So, or, so, so, yeah, so it's going to be the much. mixing that's a problem because it's MPEG encoded. So it's hard, you sort of have to. It, it, yeah, it's hard to. Frame, it depends on previous frames. Well. The yeah. major thing I think is that the um, the processor processor uh, processing requirements would go up because you'd need to be decoding each frame. Um, sorry, all frames of all sources, just in case they're going to be uh, needed in a moment's time. At the moment, the um, the display of the, the the small source monitors don't need to be updated for every frame. Uh, if we're short on CPU time, yeah, okay, so we drop some flame, frames from the monitors. Doesn't matter really. Okay, last question over here. Um, I saw a number of years ago a, a chip that was doing real-time, um, that could do um, full 800 by 600 OG Theora compression at, I think it was 640 by 480 at 60 frames a second, uh, and 800 by 60, 600 at 30. Um, and obviously, you know, different machines are more powerful. Have you, is the back end... Or is that is that handle in Vapor that it, that is um, deciding which all the machines transcoding are going to... is outside of DV switch. Okay, sorry. So it's yeah. just as I said, it's a command sync, uh, and use any command. And it might be FFmpeg2 Theora today, or it might be I don't know anything you want. Just to give you an idea of CPU usage, I mean, computers are massively powerful these days. The encoding for each stream, um, we've got two machines in each room. Right up the back, we've got the uh, mixing machine. That's taking in uh, source from the twin pack and source from the camera um, and source from the mixer and mixing up the back there. Um, I've moved the encoding, uh, live encoding basically down here again. Um, so there's a machine down the front there. That one's moved. <laughs> There, okay, in the front of each room anyway, and that's running a um, FFM Theora pipe to OG forward, I think. Yep. Yep. Um, that's using, I think, as a Core 2 duo. Or, uh, I actually, what would be, you know, either way, a lot of my Core 2 duos, and using, I think, 50% of one CPU. That's for the full PAL stuff you're seeing. So, yeah, it's, it's not too bad on, uh, on a modern CPU. Okay, can we uh, just thank Ryan and Ben for. Um for explaining all that.